So, welcome to our third video about stroke. Today we're going to discuss the posterior circulation and the strokes that affects the posterior circulation. So, let's get started. I have discussed in previous videos the anterior part of the circle of Phyllis. In this video, I'm going to discuss the posterior part of the circle of Phyllis. This starts with the right and left vertebral arteries uniting together and forming the basilar artery. The two vertebral arteries, before they unite together, give off two important branches. The first branch is the anterior spinal artery, which is formed by also a combination of the two vertebral arteries on each side. The anterior spinal artery supplies the medial part of the medulla and also goes down to supply the anterior part of the spinal cord. The other branch is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which supplies the lateral part of the medulla. After the two vertebral arteries unite to form the basilar artery, the basilar artery gives off pontine branches on each side that will supply the medial part of the pons. The lateral part of the pons will be supplied by this anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Sometimes for abbreviation they call the posterior inferior cerebellar artery pica and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery ica. And then finally the midbrain will be supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So the brain stem is composed of the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain, and this is what we're going to discuss today. The cerebellum we will discuss in a separate video. So now briefly I'm going to discuss the cranial nerves. Cranial nerve 1 and 2 comes off the brain directly. Cranial nerve 3 and 4 comes off the midbrain. Cranial nerve 5, 6, 7, and 8 comes off the pons. And finally the medulla gives off cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12. So two nerves comes off the brain, two nerves comes off the midbrain, four nerves comes off the pons, and four nerves comes off the medulla oblongata. Cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve, and this nerve is responsible for the sense of smell. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve, and this is responsible for vision. Cranial nerve three is the oculomotor nerve, and this is responsible for supplying most of the extraocular muscles, except two muscles, which are the lateral rectus muscle and the superior oblique muscle. Cranial nerve 4 is the trochlear nerve, and this supplies the superior oblique muscle. Cranial nerve 5 comes off the pons, it's the trigeminal nerve. This nerve is responsible for sensation of the face, and also general sensation of the anterior to a third of the tongue, as well as the motor innervation to the muscles of mastication. Cranial nerve 6 is the abducens nerve, and this nerve supplies the lateral rectus muscle of the eye, which is responsible for abduction of the eye. The facial nerve is cranial nerve 7. The facial nerve is responsible for supplying muscles of facial expression, as well as taste sensation from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The facial nerve also supplies the stapedius muscle, which is responsible for controlling the loud noises. The facial nerve also supplies lacrimation of the eye, salivation through supplying the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. Cranial nerve 8 is the vestibular cochlear nerve, and this nerve is responsible for hearing and balance. Cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve. The glossopharyngeal nerve is responsible for general and taste sensation from the posterior third of the tongue. It also supplies one motor muscle, which is the stylopharyngeus muscle. It supplies the carotid body baro and chemoreceptors. It also supplies parasympathetic to the parotid gland for salivation. The vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10. The vagus nerve supplies parasympathetic innervation to most of the organs of the thorax and abdomen. The vagus nerve also supplies motor innervation to most of the muscles of the pharynx and larynx, so it's responsible for phonation and also for deglutition of food. The vagus nerve also supplies the carotid body baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. Cranial nerve 11 is the spinal accessory nerve. This nerve supplies two muscles in the neck, the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle. The cranial part of this nerve comes off the medulla oblongata. And finally, the hypoglossal nerve supplies muscles of the tongue. There is a simple trick I'd like you to keep in mind when we go through the different types of brainstem strokes. All the numbers that can be multiplied to 12 are as follows. So 2 times 6 equals 12. 3 times 4 equals 12. Very simple. Forget about the 2 because the 2 comes off the brain immediately. 
So we're left with crane number three, crane number four, crane number six, and crane number 12. All these nerves, their nuclei are located medially in the brain stem. The rest of the cranial nerves, their nuclei are located laterally. This very simple trick will help us to localize the brain stem stroke, as we're going to see later on. Also, the location of the cranial nerve nuclei will help localize the lesion or the stroke. The only exception to this rule is cranial nerve 5, which is the trigeminal nerve, and cranial nerve 8, which is the vestibular cochlear nerve. The nuclei of these two nerves are too big, so they are not really localized to the pons, so we should not use them to localize the stroke to the pons. Other than these two nerves, you can use the rest of the nerves to localize the stroke to a certain brainstem division. This is just a quick review to the blood supply to the brainstem. The medial medulla is supplied by the anterior spinal artery. The lateral medulla is supplied by the posterior inferior cerebellar artery or pica. The medial pons is supplied by the paramedian branches of the basilar artery. The lateral pons is supplied by the anterior inferior cerebellar artery or ICA. The midbrain is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. And then the blood supply to the cerebellum consists of three arteries, the superior cerebellar artery, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, and then the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. This is a cross-section of the medulla, and I want you to notice the structures that's located in the lateral part of the medulla, and also the structures that's located on the medial part of the medulla. I've written the structures on the medial part with green, and I've written the structures on the lateral part on black. So the hypoglossal nucleus is located in the medial medulla. This is the nucleus for cranial nerve 12. And if we remember the rule, we said cranial nerve 12 is a medial structure in the medulla. The medial meniscus is continuation of the dorsal columns that carries sensations of vibration and position sense. The pyramids are the corticospinal tracts. So lesion in the corticospinal tracts will result in spastic paralysis. So these three structures are located in the medial medulla. The structures that's located in the lateral medulla includes the inferior vestibular nucleus. This is one of the vestibular nuclei. If there is a lesion there, there will be some sort of disequilibrium. The inferior cerebellar peduncle. Dysfunction will result in cerebellar dysfunction like ataxia. The spinal trigeminal nucleus is one of the nuclei of trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve 5. This is a huge nucleus that spares most of the brain stem. Lesion in this nucleus will result in loss of pain and temperature sensation from the face. But since this is a big nucleus, we cannot really rely on it when we try to localize the lesion on the brain stem. The lateral spinal thalamic tract carries pain and temperature sensation from the contralateral side of the body. And finally, the nucleus ambiguous supplies muscles of the branchial arches of the pharynx and larynx through the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve. So cranial nerve 9 and 10. And still, if we remember our rule, so these nerves fall within the lateral part of the medulla. All right, so let's now go through these syndromes one by one. The first syndrome is the lateral medullary syndrome sometimes called Wallenberg syndrome, and this is because of occlusion of the pica or the posterior inferior cerebellar artery or the vertebral artery. The pica is a branch of the vertebral artery, so occlusion of either one will result in this syndrome. The structures affected include the vestibular nuclei. This will result in vomiting, vertigo, and nystagmus. The inferior cerebellar peduncle, and this will result in ipsilateral ataxia and dysmetria. Ataxia means tendency to fall towards the lesion. Remember, the cerebellum controls the ipsilateral side of the body, and that's because the cerebellum is connected to the contralateral cerebral cortex. The lateral spinal thalamic tracts will result in contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation from the body, because remember, the spinal thalamic tracts crosses the midline at the level of the spinal cord. The spinal trigeminal nucleus will result in ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation from the face. The nucleus ambiguous, which supplies the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves, towards the muscles of the pharyngeal arches. This will result in dysphagia, which is difficulty in swallowing, hoarseness of voice, dysarthria, which is difficulty in speaking, and then absent of the gag reflex. Affection of the descending sympathetic fibers will result in epsilateral Horner's syndrome. Medial medullary syndrome results from occlusion of the anterior spinal artery. And the structures affected includes the hypoglossal nucleus, this will result in ipsilateral muscle weakness because, remember, this is a lower motor neural lesion. 
and this will result in deviation of the tongue towards the affected side because of the action of the muscles of the contralateral side. Effect of the pyramids will result in contralateral limb weakness, upper and lower, and lesion finally on the medial meniscus will result in contralateral loss of vibration, position sense, and discriminative touch. Now let's talk about the pawns. This is a cross-section of the pawns showing the structures on the medial pawns and the structures on the lateral pawns. The structures in the medial pawns include the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which is responsible for conjugate eye movements towards the right or towards the left, the abducens nucleus, which is cranial nerve 6, and remember cranial nerve 6, 2 times 6 equals 12, so 6 is medial nerve. This is responsible for controlling the lateral rectus muscle, which causes abduction of the eye. The medial meniscus, which is a continuation of the dorsal column, which carries vibration, position, and discriminative touch. And finally, the corticospinal tracts, which is carrying motor fibers to the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, where is lesion causing spastic paralysis. On the other hand, structures on the lateral pawns includes the vestibular cochlear nuclei, so you would expect problems with hearing and equilibrium. The spinal trigeminal nucleus, again, and you would expect problems with pain and temperature sensation of the face on the ipsilateral side of the face. The facial nerve nucleus, remember, facial nerve is cranial nerve 7. So this falls within the rule. It's a lateral structure. The middle cerebellar peduncle, so a problem again with the cerebellum. So let's count all of this together. Lateral pontian syndrome is caused by occlusion of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery or ICA, which is a branch of the basilar artery. The structures affected include the facial nucleus and nerve on the ipsilateral side, and this will result in ipsilateral paralysis of the entire face, because remember, the facial nerve supplies muscles of facial expression. This will lead also to loss of taste sensation from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, loss of lacrimation, loss of salivation, and also loss of the corneal reflex. The spinal trigeminal nucleus, remember, is a big nucleus, is a large nucleus, so we saw it on the medulla, and we also see it here in the pons. So, lesion in the spinal trigeminal nucleus will result in ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation from the face. Lesion in the vestibular nuclei will result in nausea, vomiting, vertigo, and nystagmus. Lesion in the cochlear nuclei will result in ipsilateral sensory neural hearing loss. The lateral spinothalamic tract lesion will result in contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation of the entire body. Lesion in the middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles will result in ipsilateral ataxia. And finally, descending sympathetic fibers lesion will result in ipsilateral Horner's syndrome. A very easy way to localize the lesion here is to focus on the facial nerve problem and the vestibular cochlear nuclei problems, because these nuclei are located on the lateral pawns. So if you can recognize these, you can easily localize the lesion to the lateral pawns. <laughs>
by a lesion or damage to the medial longitudinal fasciculus and this is a disorder of horizontal conjugate eye movement so the vertical eye movement is not involved it's only the horizontal gaze that's involved and it's all about a problem with adduction of the opposite eye so let's say you want to look towards the right the abducens nerve nucleus receives the impulse and send it to the lateral rectus muscle on the fc lateral side that causes abduction of the right eye so your right eye will look towards the right side at the same time the abducens nerve nucleus sends an impulse through the medial longitudinal fasciculus to the opposite or the contralateral oculomotor nerve nucleus this will act on the medial rectus muscle that causes adduction of the left eye so the left eye will as well look towards the right if there is a lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus most specifically here the left medial longitudinal fasciculus if there is a lesion here your left eye will not be able to adduct because it's not receiving that impulse from the contralateral abducens nucleus if you look at the image on the right side here let's say this is the right eye and let's say this is the left eye and let's say you have a lesion on the right medial longitudinal fasciculus if you try to look towards the right there will be no problem but if you try to look towards the left side the right eye is not able to adduct because there is a lesion in the right medial longitudinal fasciculus the right oculomotor nerve nucleus is not receiving impulse through the medial longitudinal fasciculus from the contralateral abducens nerve nucleus the left eye is still able to abduct but unfortunately with nystagmus one very important clinical point is that medial longitudinal fasciculus is a highly myelinated structure so it's very sensitive to demyelinating disorders like multiple sclerosis. So if you are encountered with a patient with bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, think more of multiple sclerosis. Patients with unilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia is more likely to have a stroke. This is a cross-section of the midbrain. And the structures I would like you to focus on includes cranial nerve 3 or oculomotor nerve nucleus, including the Edinger westphal nucleus, which is the parasympathetic part that's responsible for innervating the sphincter pupillary muscle and the ciliary muscles, which is responsible for accumulation. The medial lumeniscus. The red nucleus is a structure involved in the motor coordination of the upper limbs. The medial longitudinal fasciculus. And finally, the pyramidal tracts, which is the corticospinal tract, and the corticopontine tracts, which is part of the corticobulbar tracts. This whole structure here is called the cerebral peduncles. There are two syndromes that can affect the midbrain. The first is called Benedict syndrome, and the second is called Weber syndrome. In Benedict syndrome, the manifestations include cranial nerve 3 palsy, which manifests as FC lateral eye that's down and out because of paralysis of most of the extraocular muscles, except the lateral rectus and the superior oblique muscles. Loss of the light reflex and dilated fixed pupil because of the loss of the parasympathetic innervation that's coming from the edinger westphal nucleus. Also, medial lumeniscus lesion will result in contralateral loss of proprioception, vibration, and discriminative touch. If the red nucleus is affected, this will result in contralateral ataxia and tremors. The second syndrome is called Weber syndrome. This also includes cranial nerve 3 palsy, so FC lateral eye, down and out, loss of the light reflex, and dilated fixed pupil. Here, the corticospinal tract is involved, so contralateral spastic hemiplegia and corticobulbar tract involvement also will result in contralateral lower face spastic paralysis. Remember, we said only the lower face because the upper face receives bilateral innervation from both corticobulbar tracts. The difference here you can appreciate between the two syndromes is that Benedict syndrome has more association with ataxia and Weber syndrome has more association with hemiplegia. Both syndromes are caused by occlusion of the paramedian branches of the posterior cerebral artery. As I mentioned earlier, the red nucleus is a structure involved in the motor coordination of the upper limbs. Parino syndrome is caused by lesion of the posterior midbrain, which includes the superior colliculus and the pretectal nucleus. It can be caused by a stroke in old patients, multiple sclerosis in middle-aged women, tumors, especially pineal gland tumors or pineloma in younger patients. So just by knowing the age of the patient, we can think of the most likely lesion that will result in this parinol syndrome. Associated features include paralysis of the upward gaze, where the patient cannot look up, pseudo argyle robertson pupil because of lesion of the pretector nucleus, so there will be loss of the light reflex, but preservation of accommodation. This same lesion happens with 
neurosyphilis. That's why it's called here pseudo agarobotrin pupil, because it looks like the pupil of people with neurosyphilis. And finally, if the region compresses the cerebral aqueduct, can result in obstructive hydrocephalus. Now I'd like to talk about the difference between decorticate versus decerebrate rigidity. First, I'd like to note that the upper limb flexors are more facilitated through the red nucleus, and the lower limb flexors are more facilitated through the corticospinal tracts. So if there is a lesion above the red nucleus, the corticospinal tract facilitation is lost, so you will get extension of the lower limbs. But since you are disinhibiting the red nucleus, you will get more upper limb flexors action. So the upper limb flexors will be predominating, so there will be flexion of the upper limbs. In this case, this is called decorticate rigidity. On the other hand, if the lesion is below the red nucleus or at the level of the red nucleus, then you're losing both facilitators, the red nucleus and the corticospinal tract. So you'll get extension of both the upper limbs and the lower limbs. So in decerebrate rigidity, both the upper and lower limbs are extended. That's because you lost the red nucleus and you lost the corticospinal tracts. So the lesion is at or below the red nucleus. So that means inhibition of the red nucleus. This implies more severe brain damage and more severe prognosis. So this is common more with pontine strokes. On the other hand, in decorticate rigidity, the upper limbs are flexed while the lower limbs are extended. This is because the region is above the red nucleus, so there will be disinhibition of the red nucleus. The rubrospinal tract facilitates flexors of the upper limbs. And as I said, the corticospinal tract facilitates the lower limb flexors and is lost in both lesions. I used to remember this by decorticate means cortex. So corticospinal tract only is affected. And decerebrate is both. I would like to discuss a very rare syndrome called Clover Busey syndrome. This syndrome is very rare, very unusual, because you have to hit the two temporal lobes at the same time. That's why it's very rare. So it's a bilateral lesion of the amygdala, which is present in the temporal lobes. This syndrome is characterized by the disinhibited behavior, like hyperorality, hypersexuality, and hyperphagia. So really, you wouldn't want to be close to someone with this syndrome. Unfortunately, it's going to be a very bad experience. This syndrome, in order to be caused by stroke, is very, very unusual, but more likely to be caused by herpes simplex virus 1, because herpes simplex virus 1 has tropism or love towards the temporal lobes. So most likely, this syndrome will be caused by herpes simplex virus 1. Finally, I want to go quickly through important brain nuclei. You need to know the location of these nuclei and the neurotransmitter they release. The first one is called nucleus basalis of Mineret. This is located in the basal forebrain. That's why it's called basalis. This secretes acetylcholine. There will be decreased activity in patients with Alzheimer's disease. The next one is called nucleus accumbens. This is also located in the basal forebrain, mostly gabinergic neurons. It's important in the reward system or the reward pathway like food, water, sex, and addiction. There will be decreased activity with anxiety and depression. Deep brain stimulation of the nucleus accumbens can help to treat severe depression. Locus cereolus is located in the posterior cones. This secretes norepinephrine, and it's related to arousal, attention, memory, and emotions. There will be decreased activity with depression, increased activity with anxiety and stress. Raphae nuclei are located also in the pons, medulla, and secretes serotonin. They modulate pain at the level of the spinal cord by regulating the release of encephalins at the dorsal horn, which inhibits pain sensation. It also has a role in circadian rhythm. The ventral tegmental area is located on the floor of the midbrain, near the midline, and secretes dopamine. There will be decreased activity in Parkinson's disease and depression, and increased activity in schizophrenia. Substantia nigra is located in the midbrain, secretes dopamine in the nigrostriatal pathway, and there will be decreased activity in Parkinson's disease. We've reached the end of the stroke series. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and stay tuned for the practice questions. See you next video.